Good afternoon. Our next session is called Tales Impossible, but it could be called Very Dangerous People. <laughs> you are going to hear from some MBA 1s, some MBA 2s, and some al recent alums about what they have made possible at Stern and beyond. But take my warning seriously, they are very dangerous. They are risk takers, they are passionate, they are in many ways extremely unreasonable people. <laughs> uh, there's a saying that all progress in the world comes from precisely the unreasonable people. So we're going to see progress in action. Uh, that, by the way, is from George Bernard Shaw, uh, the, a famous Irish playwright. And I think this session is kind of a play. I think we're going to put on our play. So the title of the play is Tales Impossible, but it is also known as Dangerous People. <laughs> OK, we're ready. So revival style empowers women from the rural villages of India to the streets of New York City. Hello, everyone. I'm Allie Taylor from NYU Stern, and this is my friend and business partner, Neetu Sadhu from NYU Gallatin. We actually met, developed our business idea, and launched our micro collection all while uh, attending grad school here at Stern. And our business idea was essentially a social enterprise. It was an apparel line that could blend high style with high social impact. So to kick off our story, we're going to tell you a little bit about ourselves, because we all know that the key ingredient in any new venture is the team. So myself, I started a career in marketing. I was working primarily in brand strategy and project management, and I really liked marketing. But I felt that as I was getting older, I was really neglecting my childhood dream, and that was to be a fashion designer. I wanted to start my own clothing line, um, and I'd studied uh, social entrepreneurship while abroad at Copenhagen Business School, and I wanted to find a way to create a sustainable clothing line, but I didn't know where I was going to start. And if I, didn't stop, or if I didn't start it then, though, I knew I was never going to do it. So I quit my job, and I moved to New York. Um, I applied for a master's program at NYU Gallatin, and I was terrified. I got here, and I didn't know anybody, and I was like, what the heck did I just do? Um, but two years later, I'm so happy that I took that bold move, because without that, I wouldn't be here as the co-founder of Revival Style, and I would never have met Ali. And likewise, had we not both taken these risks, I never would have met Nietzsche. So my story is a little bit different. I actually started out in the fashion industry um, and quickly transitioned over into the nonprofit space. I loved both of them, but for very, very different reasons. And it was through experiencing both of these different industries that I saw there was a huge disconnect in how they operated. Well, like any of us know, uh, when there's a problem, there's also an opportunity. So I thought, you could do something really amazing if you could get the people in the fashion world to just work with the nonprofits. This actually is a pretty big challenge and one I recognized that I wasn't quite ready to take on on my own. And so that's what actually led me to NYU Stern. So in my first semester here, I actually attended an info session for a new class that was being launched. It was called Social Problem-Based Entrepreneurship. And the idea behind the class was to spend two weeks doing field research in India and then come back and incubate a business idea to solve a global issue, likely agriculture or healthcare. Well, I'll never forget when I was sitting in this info session and a girl who I didn't recognize, me too, raised her hand and asked if we could do a special project on the garment industry. It was like a light bulb had gone off. I finally knew that there was someone else with a similar interest. So Nitu and I connected after the info session and realized we did have this shared passion. And so lo and behold, we moved forward, uh, traveled to India, which happened to be my first trip out of the country. And it was through that that we realized more than just having a shared idea, we had a shared vision. We wanted to leverage the fashion industry for social change. And never in a million years could we have known that this class would lay the foundation for the journey which we're now on. And that journey is Revival Style. So what is Revival Style? Um, basically, we work with rural Indian artisan women who are skilled in weaving, embroidery, and beadwork, and the US garment manufacturing system 
to design and produce stylish but also ethically respond or ethical clothing that we then sell directly to women here in North America. And our brand mantra is look good, feel good, do good. I'm going to walk you through that. And so look good is really our design philosophy. What we do here is we fuse the ornate beauty of traditional Indian craft with modern silhouettes so that we can achieve a look that would appeal to your modern day fashionista. Feel Good is our attempt to really lessen some of that body dissatisfaction that so many women here experience in North America. And how we do that is through the positive message inscribed in our clothing labels. And finally, getting to the heart of the social venture is Do Good. What we do for these women in rural parts of India is we provide them with sustainable and equitable employment, um, as well as skills training that allows them to break the cycle of poverty, not just for themselves, but also for their children. So in terms of mine and Ali's journey, it all really started last May, right here at Stern. We had just finished finals, we came together, and we were excited and pumped to start this clothing line. So we established the designs for uh, three pieces, uh, two dresses and a blouse. We were going to create a pilot or a micro collection that we could test while we were in grad school. So we came up with a name, we had the designs, and we wanted to go to India and get started, but we didn't have any money. So putting our scrappy <laughs> entrepreneurial minds together, we created a passionate, uh, low-budget video. We put it up on Indiegogo's site, and in six weeks, we were able to fundraise uh, $10,000. So with our designs and our funding in hand, we headed to India, where we worked with our NGO partner and the women in the villages to embellish all the fabrics, um, and it was such an amazing uh, and rewarding experience for both of us. So coming back to New York in the fall, we constructed the embellished fabrics into finished goods for the market right here in New York. Um, the cool thing about what we're doing is we get to work with the women in rural parts of India, which is what is our global impact, but we're also having a small local impact by working with local U.S. manufacturers for the construction portion of the line. And so moving into the spring semester, we were ready to introduce Revival Style to the world. And we did that by debuting our collection on February 1st at the Gallatin Sex Posed Fashion Show. We also were featured uh, in a second fashion show hosted by NYU Stern's Luxury and Retail Club and Social Enterprise Association. And this was at Think Social Drink Local. And most recently, something we're quite excited about is that we're starting to gain media attention even though we're small. And if you check out the current issue of Marie Claire, Revival Style has a nice little shout out. So please do take a moment to see it. So outside of the runway and all the great media attention that we were getting throughout the semester, what Ali and I really had our hands busy with was business plan competitions. Uh, we entered the NYU Gallatin Founders Fund, which we're happy to say we went on to win. Uh, we also placed in the finals for the Stern Social Venture Business Plan Competition, one of the top three teams. And we also were recognized as one of the top 40 projects among 2,000 through the Dell Social Innovation Challenge. So you're probably all thinking, this is a nice story. But what do the clothes actually look like? Let's find out. <laughs> Let's hear it for these lovely ladies. You've been so gracious to model Revival Style for us. Thanks, guys. And now, just a few parting thoughts from one journey to another. First, make every moment count. Leverage the Stern community as well as the NYU community. You never know where you may just meet your next business partner. Uh, second, I'd encourage you to get to know your professors and the alumni. You are now a part of this amazing global network. Take advantage of it. Get to know them and build real relationships. Because frankly, I can't tell you how nice it is that we now have our professors and our mentors on speed dial. It's true. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and they're good to us. <laughs> and finally, just have fun. It's going to be an amazing two years, and I wish you all the best of luck as you begin your journey here at Stern. I just want to say, um, sorry, thank you so much. We've left our email addresses up on the screen if you want to reach out. 
Uh, we're also holding a trunk show for Revival Style next Wednesday, and everyone in the room is welcome. Uh, if you can just RSVP on our Facebook page, <laughs> there's more details. Uh, you've been a lovely audience. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Hi. Afternoon. Are you looking good, feeling good, doing good? Are you looking good? Can't you tell? Look. <laughs> Ask around. Uh, how many of you know exactly what you want to do after you get this MBA? Let's see hands. You know exactly what you want to do. It's okay. Let's see it. I want to see the egos in the room. Let's see it. That's good. That's good. I assure you, that's really good. How many of you have no idea? Absolutely no idea. The lack of egos in the room. And everyone else is just in between? How many of you think the other group is just crazy? I, I, when I sat in your seats in 2007, I was probably in the latter category. I, I had no idea what I was going to do. I didn't know how quite I was going to get there. My name is Adam Gromis. I had graduated in 2010. I started in 2007, let me get this right, because uh, I was a dual degree student, went to Wagner as well. And I think most of us, uh, whatever our paths are, wherever we're going, it probably looks something like this. I mean, you kind of imagine that post Stern, there's a bit of a hockey stick growth curve, right? This might be your revenue someday, right? This is your cash flow. I just started paying off my loans, and I didn't draw the valley that's in between. Because <laughs> it was off the chart, so I apologize about that. So I don't have much in the way of advice for you, but I can certainly offer my experience, and I've bucketed it into this nice little framework that I call my four Ps. Don't take this into your marketing classes. It doesn't apply. This won't work for a consulting interview. I apologize. But first, people, because the world's about people. Second, professors, because professors aren't people. <laughs> no, it's because this is a school, and you should get to know your professors. Third, places, because location's important, and play, because I needed a fourth category that was kind of a catch-all, and that's what we went with. <laughs> Sorry about that. But I did find my experience at Stern to be incredibly rewarding and lead me on a path that I could not have imagined beforehand. When I was sitting in your seats in 2007, I, uh, like you, was completely full of myself. <laughs> like any good Stern, like any good MBA. Full of myself. But uh, paradoxically, I was also incredibly intimidated sitting in your seats today. I'd gone through a couple of cocktail hours with all of you. I'd seen what incredible people my peers were. I was new to the big city. I come from a little place called Fresno. Anybody know Fresno? It's like the butt of Hollywood jokes. <laughs> Raisins are from there, pistachios, shares from there. <laughs> I had done engineering, like many of you are likely engineers, but I'd come from a nonprofit background, worked in clean tech, and I wanted to examine the, the interfaces between business and government. So I wasn't sure if I would fit in. I had an archetype in my mind that there was some sort of aggressive business type that I was not. So sitting in your seats, I was incredibly intimidated. And everyone was so well-groomed. This is like coming to a Mensa conference for metrosexuals or something <laughs> at Stern. But CERN is a good-looking school, so make sure to keep it clean. <laughs> so I, despite all that, I was so struck, so delightfully surprised at the diversity of backgrounds that my peers came from, at the circuitous paths that they took to get here, at the crazy paths they took after here, but at the incredible success that they're having in life and at how much I've gained from these people. You and the people sitting next to you, you will become great friends. Some of you will marry one another. I guarantee it. It'll get really weird. <laughs> you will. You will go to each other's weddings. That's what I do now. That's what I've been doing for the last couple of years. We hang out still. We, we take part in the city. This is an incredible group of people. And you will never meet another group of people like this all together. I want to introduce you to one. I'm going to call her out. Lauren Clark who worked for our organization, who interned for us in the spring. If you don't know Lauren, you should get to know Lauren. She worked for IntelliCap in India for a couple years, worked for a fantastic microfinance organization called MicroVest. She speaks a couple languages, turned down INSEAD to come to Stern. You should get to know Lauren. Lauren Clark. So don't just network. 
It really means something. It really does. When you need a job later in life, it will really come in handy. It is a net. It's a network of people to help buoy you. You'll be sitting across the negotiation table from these people. You'll be picking up the phone. I'm a phone call or an email away from a subject expert on any subject I can think of these days. That's incredible. Never before has that opportunity been there. Not our parents' generation didn't have that. You will have that now because of the most expensive Rolodex you'll ever buy, <laughs> which was Stern. But it's a very useful Rolodex. When I was sitting in your seat, I had no idea which line to get in. It seemed like there was a couple of well-grooved paths. I didn't feel like I fit necessarily in any one category. And what I suggest you do when you don't know what to do is do as many things as possible. Now, what I did, probably mistakenly, I started avoiding finance classes. I started avoiding M&A. I started avoiding the things that I didn't think I would be doing later in life. I was scared of banking. I had no idea what that meant. I wanted to study business in the business sector. So I started avoiding those classes. Now, lo and behold, a couple years later, I worked for this incredible organization called the Global uh, Impact Investing Network. We work in the finance industry. It is a nonprofit, but what I do all day is I talk to Swiss bankers somewhere in Liechtenstein managing billions for companies I've never heard of, trying to connect them with private equity and fixed income assets from all around the world that are trying to do good and make money. Don't you think I wish I would have gone to a couple more finance classes <laughs> in my first and second year's turn? I really do. I really do. But I was so struck when, and these are the type of companies that we work with. And so you can imagine how far off I was when I was in my first year at Stern. Now, I was so surprised then when Professor Roy Smith took my call last year because I wanted to talk to him about what we're doing, what my program is doing with private equity. And I'd taken his one private equity class on entrepreneurial finance. I must have been his worst student. I got a terrible grade in this class. He still took my email. He still met with me. He connected me with a, with a colleague at Goldman. It was incredible. I urge you to do the same. Get to know your professors. Get to know who they are. I had a great time in, in a lot of my classes, but I want to call it in particular Professor Sonia Marciano took her strategy class uh, first year and second year. She got my group to do a lecture for her undergrad class in, in the second year. Professor Frances Milliken, I was her TA for two years in a course that she pioneered here. It was called Sustainable Enterprises or Managing Sustainable Enterprises at the time. I think it's called something different now. Uh, but we still stay in touch. In fact, the other day, I was talking with a, a major US pension fund and meeting a couple people. And, and someone said, you were my TA. And I thought, oh my god. <laughs> I hope I did a good job. But that's the kind of thing you will experience. I guarantee it. You will meet people that you're sitting next to now later in life in an, with another hat on. And it will be so important, the connections you made, and particularly to those of your professors. So the advice is similar. Get interested, make friends, at least look like you're interested so they'll take your call later despite the grade you got. Very important. How many dual degrees in the room? That's awesome. That's great. You have a responsibility to help get your Stern classmates outside of the building. Most, a typical Stern MBA does not leave this building, but NYU is rich with top 10 schools all over the place. Law, Wagner, Tisch, Courant, they're all over the place. Check out what the school has to offer. I had the great fortune of going to Wagner as well. I was also part of the NYU Reynolds program for social entrepreneurship. Helped introduce me to a lot of other folks from Steinhardt uh, and, and, and Gallatin and other schools. Get to know what's around you. There's, there's business partners to be found. There's subject experts to be found. And then there's this place that is New York. I, this is going to sound like I drank the Kool-Aid, but this really is a school in and of the city. Your campus is not like any other. It is Washington Square Park, where I got to see then-Senator Obama speak in 2007 on the campaign trail. I got to see uh, 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 Professor Bill Easterly talk about microfinance. I got to go boating around the island that is Manhattan with my part-time MBA friends or go up and visit a green roof up in the Bronx for a Stern Consulting Corps project that we did. It was an incredible experience, and I urge you, especially those outside of New York like, like I was before, uh, definitely take advantage of this city. Get out of Stern. <laughs> Leave these walls and be enriched by it. Finally, play. I put a lot in this category because, like I said, it was a catch-all, but I need to offer you some paradoxical advice. Take care of yourself, and I really mean that. The next two years will be very difficult. This train is not going to stop. Take care of your relationships. Take care of your families. Be good to that. And 
Don't miss a happy hour. Don't miss a beer blast. Go to everything you can. Take part in everything. Get in all the clubs that you can do because you will find it a very rewarding experience, a very rich experience. I was on the uh, leadership of SCA for two years and part of the club for three. We did all kinds of events, including the Think Social Drink Local. Now, I don't want to push one club over the other, but when we started SCA, there was like 40 students in my first year. Now SCA is third, second largest club here at Stern. It's definitely the funnest. I don't want to, again, not to put one club over the other. I know you're going to Club Expo later, so you can sign up with the SCA folks there. <laughs> we did great treks. We started treks uh, my year, and there was always a service component involved. And then there's all, all kinds of great opportunities. I'm sure you've been finding out about like Follies, which I got to host for two years and host the ABBA state auction. Take advantage of what's there. You're, you're never going to have so little responsibility surrounded by such wonderful, good-looking people in your life for the next two years. Take full advantage. So. I hate to be like that guy that tries to sum it all up with a one-liner at the end. Uh, has anyone read this book? I haven't either. But I, <laughs> like any good MBA, I was like preparing this presentation like last night and I had to find something that summed it all up and I typed in paradox, I typed in changes. There's a quote for it. So <laughs> I will say that it's so much about the relationships that we make and the language that we learn to name the world, that's what it's been about for me, and that's so much about what Stern did. It helped me realize, recharacterize value for me and how I can contribute value. I really wish at least the same for you. I wish you the best of success and a great couple of weeks before school starts. Take care. Thanks. My name is Kathy Yan, and I am a dual degree student. I'm in my second year at Stern, as well as at the Tisch Film School. And I know there's about 10% of you out there that are dual degree students, too. So you might identify with me here. When I say that, sometimes you kind of feel like a mutt. Uh, you don't really belong in one school or the other. Or when you're taking classes in one, you're kind of thinking, oh, maybe I should make that film one day. So for me, I spent my last year, my first year, uh, at Stern, and I got a great business education out of it. I learned some finance, thanks to William Sober, who is a legend, and I really encourage all of you to take his Foundations of Finance class. It's amazing. Take it, take it, take it. Thank you. Um, but really, I think the most rewarding experience that I had at Stern, outside of William Sober, is um, uh, was, uh, was also outside of the classroom, which is an activity that I pursued and actually merged a lot of my interests in both business as well as in like social media, new media, and film, um, as well as kind of my two programs. And I managed to do this while I was still at Stern. And this activity was promotion pictures. I'm sure a lot of you haven't heard about it, so I'm going to talk about it a lot. Uh, but it's a student-run production company. Um, it's under the Stern... Entertainment Media Technology Association, EMTA, uh, here. And it is um, a production company that actually spans three schools. While it sits at Stern, it actually spans Stern, the Tisch Film School, as well as most recently, starting last year, the Tisch Interactive Telecommunications Program, ITP. That is the last acronym I have to write. Um, so I got really interested in promo, or what drew me to promo was the ability to actually work with brands um, on a for hire basis while we're still students. So it was a real world opportunity to work with people outside of Stern, um, great students at Tisch and at ITP, to come up with a concept, to pitch it directly to the marketing heads of these brands that sponsor us every year. And then with a budget that they give us, really produce something um, and develop these great working relationships with them. And so I became heavily involved with Promotion Pictures, and I am one of the executive producers. And I'm going to stop blabbering now, and I'm going to show you a quick video that we have. It's our sizzle reel, and it sort of shows some of the projects that we've done, as well as uh, the sponsors we've had to date. That'd be great if there's something on the screen. Sorry. There we go.
So I hope that gave you a better sense of what we do at Promotion Pictures. I also wanted to note that a lot of what you saw up there were videos because until last year, it was only two schools. It was Stern and the Tisch Film School. But now that we have ITP, it really has expanded what we're able to do and offer to our sponsors. Um, also, what you didn't see up there, but actually our last sponsor, which was Subway, there were actually two technology components to the two winning uh, web series that premiered at South by Southwest last year. And one of them was an app that went along with the story of the web series. And another one was this kind of silly augmented reality photo booth where you could just kind of stretch your hands wide and it will give you a photo of a giant Subway sandwich that was exactly the length of your arm span. Um, it was really fun. We had a lot of fun with that. But those are just two examples of what we can do. And actually, the sponsor that we'll be working with this fall is going to be a bit more ITP focused, we hope. And it'll really be able to put us at the forefront of what's happening in advertising and in marketing and doing things that are virtual experiences or you know, physical installations or some sort of combination of the two. Um, for me, as an executive producer, I also have the responsibility at, Stur um, at Promotion Pictures to reach out to brands for sponsorship. It goes something, it's like, please, yeah, OK, thank you. Um, and for me, it was a real personal reason why I ended up approaching the sponsor that will be working with us this year. About two years ago, I read about a case or about a man named John Thompson. He was a death row inmate who was ultimately exonerated for a murder that he did not commit uh, through evidence that had been withheld by the New Orleans District Attorney Office. And so when he was freed, he sued his prosecutors for withholding this evidence. And then through a series of appeals that went all the way up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court actually decided that the New Orleans DA office was not to blame for withholding evidence that could free an innocent man and actually strip John Thompson of the war that he had received. And frankly, his livelihood, because he had been in jail for over 30 years. Um, I had the privilege of meeting John Thompson in person about a year ago. And it was wonderful to hear his story live, obviously. But it was also really wonderful to see how optimistic and um, and positive he was, given everything that had happened to him. It's, well, you know, he had written a book, and Matt Damon and Ben Affleck want to make it into a movie, so there's some silver lining. <laughs> but still, what he really wanted to do was focus on helping people like him, who were exonerated, adapt into the real world. Some of these people went into prison before the internet happened, and so you can imagine how difficult it is afterwards to get a job. The um, the event was actually, though, hosted by a different nonprofit called the Innocence Project. And the Innocence Project is a nonprofit based here in New York that helps, through pro bono lawyer work, represent as well as exonerate people who are imprisoned through DNA evidence. And um, since 1992, when it was founded, they've actually freed up to 300 people. And 300 people sounds like a lot, but there's so many more out there. And the Innocence Project is just bombarded by letters from people in prison claiming their innocence and wanting them to represent their case. Unfortunately, they just don't have the capacity to do so. And it's, yeah, it, it, it is what it is. And so I was so inspired by them that I went up to them and asked, you know, whether they would want to work with Promo. I told them what we had to offer. And I also said that, frankly, we would provide much of the same service and product at a fraction of the cost that it would require to pay a professional. And so the Innocence Project will be our first ever nonprofit sponsor this year. And we'll be working with them on interactive multimedia campaigns to promote the Innocence Project, their cause, and to educate people about the American criminal justice system. I'm really happy, I guess. <laughs> happy is a great word. Um, I'm really glad that I was able to do this while I was still at Stern. And I think that I've been really, really excited by how excited everyone else is about it. Um, everyone I've spoken to, from the rest of the board members at Promo to NYU students to the administration, they're so excited that we're working with a sponsor this year that, you know, as great as Volvo and Heineken and Cisco are, and they certainly have the deep pockets, it's really wonderful to also work with a nonprofit and do something that's 
perhaps a little bit more worthwhile. Um, now I just want to say something a little more general. I think business school can sometimes feel a bit like a job factory. Um, you know, we're prepping you for a better paycheck on the way out. But I really think that there's so much more to business school than just classes or recruiting or beer blast. You can actually do a lot here. So I just encourage you to take advantage of all the opportunities that Stern, as well as NYU, which is a giant university on the best plot of land in the world, has to offer you. And just do something different while you're here. You only have two years, or maybe three for the dual degrees. Do something different. Do something that maybe you didn't think of doing before you entered, like promo. There's a club expo right after this. Um, or just do something that you think can make an impact beyond these walls. So good luck, and thank you. Wow. Hi. Good looking crowd. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I'm Zeev Krieger. This is uh, my colleague, Ben Wise. And uh, we're so excited and really honored to be able to talk to you guys about the Charter Cities Project, um, it, what it is and both how we got involved with it through the Stern Consulting Corps this past spring and really um, over the past year. Uh, and just a quick plug, uh, Stern Consulting Corps is an amazing thing. It's not just about charter cities. They have dozens of really awesome, incredible projects. I encourage all of you to, to check it out. Um, so charter cities uh, was the brainchild of this man. Some of you may have some familiarity with him, Professor Paul Romer, world-leading economist, and also apparently a gentleman rancher. Uh, <laughs> we, we found this on Google yesterday, and we're like, this is in the presentation. <laughs> So, um, but, but Paul is, uh, is a, a really uh, sort of exceptional economist, and he does a lot of work on growth theory, which basically looks at um, the way that cities evolve, the way that urban populations and urban economies can, can evolve and grow, the challenges and opportunities that they face. And he started with sort of a, a seminal question. He said, what if we took something like a special economic zone, a sort of classic uh, tool for sort of instigating growth, and made it bigger, made it more ambitious, uh, write it la writ large at the scale of a city itself, um, innovate on the governance model, innovate uh, on the financing structure, innovate on, on the ways that you build this infrastructure. And he said, and he put this idea out there, sort of hung out a shingle, and the response was immediate and pretty dramatic. So this is just one of dozens of articles. This one is from The Economist. There's articles in The Atlantic Monthly um, asking about this project. And as you can see from the headline, Hong Kong and Honduras, um, it, there was even an actual country that came to Paul and said, hey, this is an exciting idea. We want to be a part of it. We want to see if this can work here in Honduras. And so for the past couple of years, Paul has actually been working, and Paul's team has been working with the government of Honduras uh, to try to create this, this uh, charter city. So um, it's an exciting thing. And before we talk about how we got involved, I want to just give you a little bit of quick context. Why is this important? Why is urbanization, this kind of urbanization meme that everybody's talking about, so, so important? Um, so a quick fact, uh, there's about 2.5 billion people that live in cities today. By 2050, it's projected to be 5 billion people. Um, what does that mean? It's just kind of random numbers. Uh, to give you a sense of what the speed and scale of that actually looks like, this is uh, a beautiful piece of vacant land in China in 1978. A little fishing village up in the top, but it's basically vacant. And this is that same plot of land uh, less than 40 years later. And this is also known as the city of Shenzhen, which is one of the world's great megalopolises, uh, 10 and a half million people. This did not exist uh, 40 year, less than 40 years ago. So that's just kind of a nice uh, indicative you know, way to show it. For those of you who think better in numbers and graphs, we are MBA students after all. Um, there's that nice hockey stick that Adam Gomez was talking about. This is the population growth. So zero, and then somewhere out there you have 10 and a half million and it's a pretty remarkable thing just to kind of to grapple with. Um, what this also means is that behind this wave of urbanization is an equally large and ambitious wave of infrastructure development and infrastructure investment that's going to take place. Uh, one estimate here, $41 trillion, this is from Bain, uh, by 2030. And what's important to note is that this is not just uh, government dollars going out the door, a.k.a. your tax dollars at work. This is a huge agglomeration of private equity firms, sovereign wealth funds, multinational corporations, all sorts of actors who are scrambling to get involved because they know that this is happening and they want to have a seat at the table and, and be a part of it, um, as did we. 
So we're going to jump to our bios real quick, and we're going to go into the project itself. There's me. Um, my background sort of covers a range across the urban investment development landscape. I've worked uh, in emerging markets in India and Dubai. Uh, and then I also ran a company in our beloved local emerging market of Brooklyn for uh, six years. Um, and then just before school, I ran a, an organization called the Gowanus Canal Community Development Corporation, where I got to canoe. For those of you who know the Gowanus Canal or those of you who don't, it is the world's most polluted body of water. And um, for some reason, I chose to commemorate this occasion wearing an Argyle sweater. <laughs> uh, you know, lapses in judgment cannot be explained. Uh, over the summer, I worked at Goldman Sachs in the investment management division. Uh, and you know, it's, again, it's really exciting to be here. Um, now Ben's going to tell you about that. Uh, thank you, Zeev. Again, my name is Ben Wise. Um, I majored in urban studies as an undergraduate. And since then, I've been trying to position myself at the intersection of urbanization and business and international development. Um, I've worked in affordable housing finance and, and development um, for a lot of years. I worked in, I've worked in the US, I've worked in Latin America and also in Africa. And most recently before coming to Stern, I started a company with some other people to build mixed income housing in Rwanda. Um, that's what you're looking at here is a picture of one of our houses under construction. Um, and uh, this past summer I interned at LEK Consulting, which is a strategy, a global strategy consulting firm. Um, Based on Zeev's and, and my background, you could see why we were excited to get involved in the Charter Cities project once we got here to Stern. Um, we were basically sitting in the same chairs you guys are during launch, you know, nursing the hangover from Ellis Island or whatever it is, <laughs> and, uh, and so on. And uh, we're plotting our obnoxious email campaign. Um, and, so, and that went well. <laughs> so the next step was uh, the embarrassing student proposal, which uh, was rendered in terrible PowerPoint and uh, was actually roundly rejected. But, uh, but the important part about it was that we, we sent it. We, you know, we put it together, we put in some work, and we clicked send. And it started a conversation that actually led to um, the beginning of, of what turned out to be this great project. And if we hadn't have done that, it might not have turned out the same way. Um, so it was pretty critical that we did that. Um, now moving to the project itself, uh, what we were tasked with, we were a group of nine students, and what we were tasked with was to build a financial model to explore the, uh, and explain the development of this new city in Honduras. Um, we did a lot of research on infrastructure costs and investment assumptions and those kinds of things, and then we rolled them all up into this dashboard that we created. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side, those are those slider bars. Um, so you can manipulate these parameters such as population growth or cost of capital and you can see how that flows through the whole model and you can see how the growth of the city would be impacted. Um, and so our work was really well received. Um, it gave Paul a tool that he could use to help others in visualize what he was talking about when he would um, talk about his, his ideas. Um, and now he has this tool that he can use in his conversations with leaders around the world as he you know, builds support for this project. Um, we also got the chance to present to the Stern Board of Overseers as well as the Executive Board. Um, and uh, we were well received there as well. And then uh, the culmination of the semester was we got to meet with uh, the uh, Chief of Staff of the President of Honduras. Um, and he's one of these, he's a key figure in Honduran politics right now. Um, he's essentially the architect of this plan on the Honduras side. And um, it was great to be in the room with him and to be able to influence his thinking and get his, he was really engaged, he asked great questions. Um, and that was a pretty special experience for us to, to really be making an impact while in school. Um, and then again, back to, you know, as we were presenting to, to, the, to the Stern Board and then also just in, throughout our, our experiences, we found a school here. This institution has been just really enthusiastic about student-driven work. Um, and really supportive, and in particular, Jamie Tobias and Adam Brandenberger, um, I would say, like, had our backs during a lot of the process and um, giving us the support and the cover that we needed, um, as well as doing the same thing for other students who had other initiatives that were going on that they were trying to get off the ground um, and just giving us the cover that we needed. Um, yes, yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it, and again, it's, it's been a really phenomenal experience, but it just, it was all the more meaningful because the framework for our involvement didn't exist when we first um, tried to get involved. And it, and it required that little extra bit of uh, activation. And that plus the inherent intrigue of the project really made it uh, all the more kind of special. I just want to end with one or two kind of quick final closing thoughts, which is that, um, yes, this is really exciting to work on. 
But there have been some really interesting ancillary benefits to, to being involved in something like this. And specifically, in, when I talk about my experience at Stern with friends, colleagues, uh, recruiters, um, and, and I mention this project, there's this instant shift, right? What happens is I, I go from being a student applicant to a peer practitioner, somebody who is actually uh, substantially engaged in really interesting work, uh, cutting edge stuff, and, and it's applied. And it, it changes the nature and, and the texture of those conversations. And I can't emphasize how sort of important and rewarding that is. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's just been, it's, it's been a real treat and a real privilege. So thank you all so much for allowing us to, to speak to you here. And uh, you know, go knock them dead over the next few years. <laughs>
I'm starting a business, and I'd like to learn from your experience. And 9 out of 10 respond favorably, and I've gotten to know the entrepreneurial community. They've introduced me to the investment community in New York. And I've gained the confidence in my business to look some of the top venture capitalists in the eyes and say, taxi treats, this is happening with or without you. <laughs> Enough about me, let's talk about you guys. You have two years to basically do whatever it is that you want. You can sit back, passively consume the product, or you can see the two years as a platform to do whatever you want, achieve what you want, and create what you want. People say starting a business is extremely risky. I would argue that for you guys, for the next two years, it's completely risk-free. The absolute worst case scenario is you're going to part with some money, and, but in exchange for your time, you're probably going to learn something, genuinely learn something that could impact you. And when it comes time to get a real job, and you're sitting across the table from someone who works for a huge company that's probably unhappy with their job and probably talks on the weekends about starting a business and never does it, you're going to have a better story than your competition, and you're going to command their respect. So if you agree that you have the time, the resources, and the platform to start your own successful business, the next question is, what's next? So you've probably heard this week, if you're looking for opportunities, start with the problems. I would say it's even more simple than that. Anything you want to change, anything you don't like, you can improve, or even someone that you can help. Nonprofits count. Figure it out and then look for a team. Someone in this auditorium or someone in an auditorium at a different school across NYU and you're looking for passionate people who have very different skills than you. The next step is to figure out how to navigate and use the resources here. Reach out to any of the MBA 2s in the Entrepreneurs Club, EEX. Reach out to me personally and I will help you figure out what NYU can do to develop and support your business. Ask for help. I'll start right now. I'm looking for owners of clubs, bars, taxis, governments all over the world. Let me know. <laughs> Don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. Think of the most prominent people in New York, and if you research their background, write one thoughtful sentence about it, Say you're a Stern MBA launching your own business, and I guarantee they will meet with you. The next two years are going to go quickly, faster than you think. So my best advice is to start today. Thank you very much. Awesome. How are you guys doing? Good. Nice. Nice. Well, my name is Corey Blay. I'm an MBA MPA, uh, actually graduating with you. So I'm pretty excited to talk to you a little bit about my story and NYU in general. Whoa. There we go. All right. So the agenda is I'm going to talk to you about my story a little bit. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my NYU story. And then I want to talk to you about our NYU story. So, before I came to NYU, I was known simply as Mr. Blay. Uh, I taught seventh grade history at a private school in New York City uh, for six years, and I also was an administrator. Uh, we founded a new middle school, uh, which was a unique process, but I had the opportunity to do a whole lot of things. I wrote curriculum, I created the strategic plan, I made the diversity policy and the discipline policy. But the thing I loved the most as evidenced by that picture, is just being able to have an honest relationship with my students. Uh, I love being able to watch them learn, uh, watch them work, and then be able to grow with them at the same time. Uh, but unfortunately, well, actually. And uh, if you stuck around long enough, we were able to see them graduate. And I love being able to see them move off into college and find their passions and be successful. I still have an incredible relationship with many of my students. But unfortunately, some of my students weren't so lucky. 
uh, two of these students, Zaj and Philip, this was in eighth grade, uh, didn't stay on to ninth grade. And far too many boys of color, in specific, uh, were getting kicked out of school for pretty simple reasons. They were struggling in the classroom. Uh, they were losing themselves socially. And our school wasn't equipped to really deal with that, and we began expelling them at really quick rates. And even though I was in charge of handling a lot of the diversity work, I wasn't able to stop it. And that really frustrated me. Um, and I struggled for a while to find some solutions inside the school. And after a while, I realized that I needed to create the change from the outside. So I left Fieldson. I left my school in the hopes of creating a middle school for boys uh, that would prepare them for success in uh, high schools like the one that I taught at. Um, and make sure, not, not just that, but make sure that they knew their passions, that they knew what they cared about, so that when they stepped into that classroom, they were strong, that they were able to succeed. And I knew that in order to reach my dream, in order to accomplish my goals, I needed to go to business school uh, to get the skills that I needed, the knowledge base and experiences that was going to push my leadership to the next level. Uh, and undoubtedly, NYU was the right place for me. Most importantly, because I wanted to learn in the community where I lived. That was something I was really passionate about. So like many of you, my NYU story started here at launch. And I, by the end of the first day, I knew I had picked the right school. Uh, we had talked about creating value for business and society, challenging our assumptions about the way the world works, the importance of identity and diversity in culture in our economy. And these were topics I talked about in the classroom with my students. And so I knew that it was just the right fit. Uh, most importantly, I loved my classmates, and I loved the conversations we had. And I was really inspired by that. But pretty shortly once school started and launch was over, some important things happened. Uh, people a couple blocks down got a little bit upset, and they started setting up camps. And no one in school was talking about it. And that felt to me like we weren't living up to our charge. Like, we weren't doing what we could do to create value and have a conversation. So the teacher in me said, this is unacceptable. And so I did the best thing I could, which was to harass every single administrator in the school, <laughs> until they allowed me to create a panel uh, about Occupy Wall Street. And we had some phenomenal people come and speak. We had the aforementioned Roy Smith, who was also a partner at Goldman Sachs. Andy Surer, who's the managing editor of Fortune magazine. Uh, former governor of New York, David Patterson. And then this guy on the right, well, I guess, yeah, you're right. Uh, Justin Wiedis, who is an original organizer of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, I actually went down to Zuccotti Park and just picked him out to make sure he came on the panel. Uh, and it was incredible success. We had, the room was packed. We had over 200 students, faculty, staff, all participating in the conversation. And it was a really inspiring moment. Um, and in just taking that momentum, I wanted to push my own learning, because I recognized I could have an impact in the community, and I wanted to learn more. Uh, and I had the privilege to be able to participate in Adam Brandenberger's uh, Launch Projects class, which was basically an independent study where students began to question the role of business in solving social problems. And my question was, Who's responsible for rebuilding the black community? Um, I live in Harlem, and I see the changes going on there all the time. And I wanted to know how the poorest of us in that community can be able to be supported and pushed up by that growth. And this class really challenged my ideas. And I came out of it with a ton of different opinions than I had walking in. But it was really important for my growth as a leader and as a learner. Um, next one's just pretty cool. So part of business school was about exposing myself to new things. And one of those things was definitely learning more about the economy. And so I had the privilege of being able to ring in the bell with Dean Henry and other students. And it was just an awesome opportunity. I'm just showing you the picture, because it's cool. <laughs> Nothing too deep with that one, right? But 
As we move toward the end of my first year, I wanted to really be able to use the business skills that I was developing in the space that I was really passionate about, which was the education sector. So I got the SIF Fellowship from NYU, from Stern, um, which is really dedicated for quasi non-traditional students to be able to use their business skills to solve some kind of social problem. Um, I was an education pioneer. Uh, and through those two partnerships, I was able to work at Teach for America this summer, uh, working in their human, human capital and strategy uh, department. And all of these skills, once I stepped away from it, I realized I learned not only the skills necessary to be a leader, um, but had the knowledge base and experiences to move into making my dream a reality. And so now we have a name. It's no longer just random school. It's Brotherhood Prep. And as some people have mentioned beforehand, you want to find your partners here at Stern. And I have two incredible partners who were in the LPC class with me, um, working with me to be, make this dream a reality. Uh, so Brotherhood Prep is kind of the culmination of my work in my first year, and my experiences, my learning, um, and the direct application of those skills. But my NYU story is still being written. And our story is in the making. And I want to push and challenge all of you to think not only about how you can grow individually, but how you can contribute to our school community. And with that, I just want to leave you some lessons. <laughs> all right, number one, be yourself. I came to school from day one talking about the fact that I'm a teacher and that I want to build a school. I was unapologetic about that. And I believe it's important for all of you to be unapologetic about who you are and what your backgrounds are, because otherwise we can't learn from you. All right? So it's really important to be yourself. Two, make the most of your time. I, I don't feel like I need to repeat this. Everyone's been saying time moves really fast here. Uh, I'm fortunate because I have three years. Most people have two, and it goes by really quickly. So if you see an opportunity to do good, take it. Three, take the first step. You don't have to be perfect, and it doesn't make a difference if you fail. But it's important to just kind of take that first step to make a difference and make sure that if by doing so, you can leave a legacy for other people to build upon. Um, you know, Adam talked about the fact, not Brandenburger, but Adam, the other one, talked about the importance of, well, the experience of SEA. You know, when he said it was 40 people when they started, now it's one of the biggest clubs. Um, I'm hoping to have that same trajectory with the GBA. And if you're interested in the GBA, come to our table at the expo later. Um, but leave a legacy for others to build upon. It's about community. But lastly, do big things, but be humble. Right? We're all talented. We all have skills. Um, and we all want to do great things. But we don't need to big time each other. Uh, and more importantly, it's all about working together to make, get the highest impact. And I'm really passionate about that. So um, if I hear about people big timing you or each other, I'm going to come get you. <laughs> all right? And it's something I'm really, really passionate about. And if you don't believe me, ask my students. <laughs> Thank you. So I never thought I was going to go back to India. I spent six months in India right after I graduated from undergrad. And it was an incredible experience. I was working with an NGO. I was uh, teaching students in the field, literally grabbing like six or seven students and pulling them in the middle of their community. And um, we would count rocks or um, just gather things to, to talk about so that I could point to objects and, and teach them English. And it was an incredible experience to, to have this one-on-one -on -one relationship with each of these students, to understand where they were coming from, to... Um, to believe in them and to see them grow. And so it was such a rewarding experience that I never really thought that I'd go back. Um, but I, I had the opportunity to go back. Um, this is a picture of me with those students. Um, I had an opportunity to go back. And I, it was a 
really cool thing that Stern was set up with the Stern Consulting Corps. And I know that Arun Sundararajan actually came in and spoke to you guys, I see some nods, on Tuesday about the Unique Identification Authority of India. And um, this project is so monumental. This, they're literally rolling out these biometric, um, biometric identity platform tools to every single person in India, 1.2 billion people. Um, they've enrolled 200 billion so far, and 200 million, whoa, um, 200 million so far. And uh, basically, you know, what they're doing is not only creating a platform for all of these, um, for identity, for, um, you know, like a passport, or they do these smart cards in some of the states, or um, it, our little state cards that we have, like, I'm from Illinois. Um, they have all of those as well, but this is going to be something that actually encompasses everyone. Everyone will be incorporated into this platform. And it's going to be used so much more than just a platform. It's going to be used as a way of... I, so some of the students I was working with in India, um, their, their families received government subsidies, unemployment, food subsidies, those kinds of things. And um, they, it said that as part of our research um, working on this project, we learned that only 20% or 20 cents out of every dollar actually reach the intended families. And so these families were supposed to receive, you know, let's say $20 every month. Um, for food and whatever it is that they need. And, you know, a, a middleman would take a little and a middleman would take a little. And as you go down the line, they end up with $4. Um, and it's just, it's, these people are living on so little that that, that kind of change just, it's, it changes their lives. And so now some of these families can, the, the mother can go into her little convenience store and scan her finger in one of those fingerprinting scanners. And, um, and, be able to take out 50 rupees or whatever it is that she needs to pay her groceries and know that, that her bank account is safely related only to her um, and that this is, this is going to be a way that, that she can use in, in the future. So um, kind of looking back on the two experiences that I had, starting from you know, these individual relationships that I was creating and, and then realizing that I was working with, with systems. So when we went out to India, we, um, we met with all these amazing thought leaders and uh, incredible people who are, are changing the world through these platforms and thinking so big. And so the difference between when I was thinking as an individual and connecting with these students one by one versus this platform that's actually going to change the system, um, CERN was able to, to allow me to, to think bigger and give me the opportunity to do that. So I went out to India. Um, it was like 12 weeks ago. And it was such a different experience. It was fun. It was crazy. It was, we had an amazing time. So I'm just going to show a little, you know, a handy cam video of uh, some of the things that we were able to, some of our fun. All right. actually getting his unique ID like as we watched him. And we also met with some uh, India School of Business students as well. 
So we had so much fun. Um, and basically, you know, we met with all of these different people and we were in three different cities and well, some of us four and we met with literally authorities and thought leaders in every single city who, who all had, you know, really great insights and ideas of where this could go. And what was interesting was, you know, we, we had gone there and we thought we were going to just change the world. We thought we were going to, you know, us little six little stern students and we were going to tell them exactly what we thought, and they were going to be like, yeah, that's great. Um, and that didn't happen. Um, but we asked questions, and that's something that's been a theme for me um, since I've been at Stern. And um, we, we planted the seed. We, we put little bubbles of ideas in their heads and, and asked them. We were inquisitive. We, we tried to find out you know, what was behind it, where they thought it was going. And I think it really made them think about it. And so um, as I kind of look back on the experience as a whole and and try to figure out, you know, what, did, what were we able to accomplish? What weren't we able to accomplish? I realized that, you know, I've moved personally from a person who thought, wow, these individual relationships and the, you know, the 50 students that I was able to touch was so important. But what's even more important is the systems that those are based on. And so if we can go out and, and change the systems, if we can be empowered not only to, to make connections one-on-one, -on -one, but also know that, that whatever the foundation lies, that we have the ability to ask a question, to be inquisitive, and to actually say what could be possible. Um, I think that's what I've taken away from Stern, and I hope you do too. more and haven't you been sitting in here long enough and of course it's that guy who swiped your ID card told you where you had to be yelled at you when you weren't in your seat on time and all of that right that's who it had to be that's who had to be the last guy to get up here and talk so hopefully at least he'll be a little bit entertaining so I originally wanted to title this speech, Why Opportunity Sucks. <laughs> but I opted for the cheap dodgeball joke instead. <laughs> My name is Ken Herrera. I'm a very proud MBA, too. And what I intend to do over the next little bit of time, I won't be as specific as John Sexton about how much time I'm going to use. <laughs> but over the next little bit of time, I'm going to talk about how you get to become me. <laughs> and that's not, you know, a 31-year-old you know, Mexican-American guy originally from Denver. That might be very difficult for some of you. <laughs> but what I do want to talk about is how you take what's happening over these two weeks, and let me tell you, that's something very special. How do you take that and infuse that into the next year that you're going to spend at Stern so that eventually you can become me or whatever your particular version of me is. But we have to start somewhere. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start at launch. One year ago, I sat in the same seats that you're sitting in I indulged in the deliciousness that was the white box lunch. <laughs> I developed a completely unrequited crush on Cory Booker. <laughs> and I took this picture. A lot of you probably took this same picture. This one was taken a year ago. I did immediately upload it to Instagram. 
And if you can't tell, it was such an amazing picture, it didn't even need a filter. <laughs> and I engaged, just like I've seen you engaging in your classrooms. I talked with my fellow classmates. I gave them my perspective on some of the most intractable issues of our generation. I dug right in. It was fantastic. I loved it. I was all about it. And then it was over. <laughs> School had to begin. You had to start with classes. I had to take accounting. I don't have a particularly strong quantitative background. I was an educator before I came here. I had to take accounting, I had to take finance, I had to take marketing, I had to take all these skills and all these things that I was doing and mix that all in together somewhere. And just like you, I faced decisions. I faced a lot of choices. I was confused. I would have raised my hand the same way about someone who didn't know exactly what they wanted to do. Because there's so many options. You're going to walk out these doors as soon as I'm finished speaking, and you're going to be bombarded by other MBA 2s wanting you to join their clubs, wanting you to do the same functions that they've been doing all summer, wanting you to go the same places that they've been. And you're going to have to make decisions. And that's why opportunity sucks. <laughs> because when opportunity is presented to you, we probably, it's probably... It would be the worst drinking game of all time if we played the word, you know, opportunity over the course of launch. <laughs> but you have a lot of opportunity. And the key is you have to use it. You have to make a choice and a decision. Kind of like a coin. Maybe you have two sides. Maybe you have the 26-sided die from categories. I don't know. But you have to make a choice. The great thing for you, though, is... You're at Stern. So on one side is awesome, and on the other side is fantastic. <laughs> but if you just keep staring at the coin over and over and over again, nothing's going to happen. At a certain point, you have to flip it. You have to make a choice. So, just like any other MBA student, I made those choices. I thought about the things that I was going to be doing. I thought about what my life was going to be like at Stern. And Launch helped me make some of those choices. <laughs> Maybe I made a few too many of them. This is my calendar from the last week of April during the second semester of my MBA one year. Not a lot of white space, right? I took six classes, 18 credits, so a credit overload, for those of you who are maybe not familiar yet with the Stern credit system. I was writing scripts for Follies, which was the Friday before this. I wrote all of the scripts for all of our hosts. I was running three consulting projects, two for the Stern EEX Consulting Club, as well as another for an outside education organization that had approached me to help them out. I was then also participating in Stern Consulting Corps, working with a school in East Harlem on their teacher effectiveness program. Amidst all that, I was trying to fit in two weddings, both of which were out of state, that were on either side of that. Group works, interviews, admitted students weekends, a whole variety of things that were on my plate. And so what you might think is that this is the schedule of a guy who doesn't know how to say no. Right? Everyone's always told you, learn how to say no. You have to learn how to find those moments where you can go back and think about saying no so that you don't get overcommitted. I take the opposite view. I think that saying yes is much, much harder. Saying yes implies responsibility. Saying yes is making a decision. Saying yes means that you have to show up to all these meetings with your work done for your fellow classmates. But saying yes is taking full advantage of opportunity. And that's the part of opportunity that's really fantastic. I don't regret any of these decisions. I found my limits. This is about as much as I can handle. <laughs> 
And I probably would never do it again. <laughs> but I challenge you to find your limits for yourself. Maybe it's 15% less than I did, but make sure it's 10% more than you think you can. Because that's the commitment that you're making to each other. That's the commitment that you're making to that person to your left and to your right. That you're going to be able to do that. And in doing that, that's part of how you take launch. That's how part of you, part of you takes launch and brings it into the rest of your business school program. So that, like me, you become an MBA one. Wow, that fit a little bit better last year. Okay. <laughs> But I'm not here to just tell you about all the things that I did. We can talk about that later. I'm also here to be honest with you. It's not always easy. I got plenty of these as I went through the recruiting process. So did my friends and classmates. Got plenty of good ones too. But also got some grades that I didn't like. I'm an overachiever, like many of you. When you get the fourth lowest grade in your statistics class and you can figure it out because your professor gave you the distribution, it doesn't feel so great. <laughs> and so you end up with some of those lows. It's how you deal with those moments and the commitment that you make to each other that's going to allow you to bring launch into every aspect of what you do. And so I bring you two more L's, love and laughter. So on the left is my beautiful, amazing wife of three years, who is fantastic. <laughs> She would totally love that. She's going to eat that up. <laughs> totally fantastic. She's my ineffable, to use John Sexton's phrase. She was where I found those moments, where I went home to, where I was able to come back from those crushing moments, where I cried, where I had those moments that were difficult for me. On the other side, block five. I was a block leader last year as well. <laughs> Best block. They helped me get through too. These people shared my experience. We had the same professors. We shared the same jokes. We knew which person was going to arrive 35 minutes after class was supposed to start. <laughs> we knew all of those things and we shared that experience together. So as you look around, think for yourselves, who's going to provide me with that support? How am I going to build those networks of support? of fun, of what's going to help me get through what is a difficult time on occasion, a fun time, an amazing time, an inspiring time. But find those people, find those moments. And if you can find one who is financially secure, who can support you <laughs> while you're going to business school, all the better. <laughs> so I learned in consulting uh, a couple of things from consultants. Um, one, one of the ones that I take with me is, you know, under promise and over deliver. So uh, we have more L's yet to come. So don't forget, though, why you're here. You are here to learn. You're here to take those skills that you want from the classroom, and you're here to put those to use. You might think that you're going to put those to use next summer, Five years from now, ten years from now, some people have said that an MBA is a great education for a CEO. I disagree with them. I think this is a great education for you right now. For you to take the things that you are going to learn in the classroom and put them into action immediately. I want to be an entrepreneur, and I'm not afraid to say that. Doesn't scare me. Maybe it scares my wife a little bit. <laughs> Doesn't scare me, and I'm undaunted. And what I want to do is take the things that I learn and apply them immediately in the things that I want to do. I had the great fortune of taking a wonderful class where I got to come up with my own question 
and try to suss out some particular issue. Now, if you haven't guessed, I'm pretty passionate about education. And that's what this poster is about. But what this poster represents to me is less the particular words that are on this page than the fact that this is the culmination of my year. This is bringing together all of the things that I learned throughout all of my classes. This is bringing together my strategy class, my microeconomics class, the ways of thinking that I was able to learn from my time at Stern. So don't neglect that. Don't think that this is something that you're just going to use next summer or just going to use two years from now, five years from now. You're going to use it every day. And it's one hell of an education. It's worth every penny. And so, where does that leave us? Leaves us just a few minutes from the end of this presentation. Leaves you a few minutes from heading out to the Club Expo. And it leaves you with some questions. <laughs> the questions that it leaves you with is how do you get from here to there? How are you going to take launch and use it in your daily lives during the course of your first year here at Stern? How are you going to take learning and love and laughter and limits and make it through those lows to become me? <laughs> To become an MBA too. How are you going to arrive at those things? How are you going to support one another? How are you going to find your place in this community? But most of all, I turn to that question that I originally wanted to make this talk about. How do you decide among the myriad options? How do you think about choosing between awesome and fantastic? It's not easy. No one's saying it is. There's a lot of thought and self-reflection that's going to go into that. But the thing that I really encourage you to do is not get lost staring at it over and over. At a certain point, just got to flip the coin.